Morning, everyone. My name is James. I'm the intern here at Point in Baptist Church, if you don't know me. And part of the beauty of that role is that I get to work very closely with our leader, Reuben. He's, he's teaching me all he knows. He's training me up and offloading his wisdom onto me. And so today, I'll be talking about a bunch of stuff <laughs> involving a whole bunch of stuff. Now, joking aside, stuff that, we're going to be talking about friendship. Are you a good friend? You know, 12% of people say that they don't have a close friend. Churches quite often talk about marriage and parenting, but we often neglect singleness and friendship. We'll be investigating the absolute importance of friendship, through Scripture, looking at the example of David and Jonathan, which spans across eight chapters. We're going to try and condense that and go on a little tour together through 1 Samuel. So if you want to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 18, verses 1 to 9 in your Bibles, and whilst you're doing that, I'm just going to quickly summarize what happens leading up uh, to this passage. So we have King Saul, and he rejects God's authority. So God then anoints David to be the next king of Israel. After losing God's favor, Saul becomes restless and ironically appoints David to play the harp for him to help calm him down. Can you see how God is placing David where he wants him to be? And it's there in the royal courts where David meets this friend, Jonathan. Jonathan is the son of King Saul. Skipping ahead quickly, David goes on unexpectedly defeating Goliath, a warrior, and eventually leading Saul's army in many battles. And so we end up here in chapter 18, and Libby's going to read that for us now. One Samuel 18, verse 1 to 9. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return home to his family. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off the robe he was wearing and gave it to David, along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow and his belt. Whatever mission Saul sent him on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a high rank in his army. This pleased all of the troops and Saul's officers as well. When the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the woman came out of the towns of Israel to meet the, with King Saul, with singing and dancing, with joyful songs and with trimbles and lyres. And they danced and they sang. Saul has slain his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. Saul was very angry. This refrain had displeased him greatly. There was credit, um, they have credit with David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. Thank you, Libby. So, what is the importance of friendship? How important was friendship for David? You see, Jonathan perceived David as the next king of Israel after his father Saul. God picked Jonathan. Sorry, God picked David not Jonathan, the heir. And what did Jonathan do about this? Well, he accepted it. He accepted God's will by, and you see in verse 3, he handed over his robe to David. His robe was essentially his crown. Can you see what this means? Jonathan is voluntarily surrendering his rights as heir to the throne, sacrificing all his securities, his wealth, his power, out of love for his friend, David. Would you be prepared to do the same if you were asked? I wonder. I wonder also if Jonathan looked as enthusiastic as our king did when he was handed over the robe and authority of the kingdom. You see, whilst David lived in the royal courts, we're told that both Jonathan and Saul, I think it's in chapter 16, initially really loved David. Jonathan loved him, despite losing out on the kingdom. 
and Saul loved him because he benefited from his harp playing and his military success. Despite benefited, Jonathan, Saul, investor, user. Both loving David, but very differently. It's it's clear to see. And then we go to verse 7, and the women sing, Saul has struck down his thousands, and David his tens of thousands. From this moment on, Saul felt very envious, even murderous towards David. He tried to spare him twice. You see, this is where Jonathan's friendship was put into practice. During David's adversity, during David's, his friend's, tough time. So let's fly quickly through each chapter together. We'll briefly summarize the kinds of things that Jonathan did for David. Chapter 18, Jonathan commits his life to David. He gives him his robe, his everything he has. Chapter 19, he then warns David about Saul's intentions to kill him. And he devises a plan, pleading to Saul, let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He has not wronged you. And what he has done has benefited you greatly. Chapter 20, he then tests uh, King Saul's intentions to kill David, to see what's really going on. And then he warns David of the results. Chapter 20, again, they are emotional with one another. They're vulnerable They're weeping. Two men weeping together. Can you believe it? Chapter 23, they encourage one another. They reassure David of his friendship, and he strengthens David in the hand of the Lord. How many of your friends do you proactively seek to strengthen? You see, this was probably, well, it it was the most dangerous time of David's life. He was young, he was vulnerable, he was probably about 16, late teenager, and the king was out to kill him. But it was Jonathan's friendship that protected him from this evil. It was Jonathan's friendship that was perhaps the only thing keeping David alive at this time. Can you see the value of commitment, of friendship? You might think I'm being dramatic, but I I don't. You might be thinking, well, can't a spouse do these things? Can't a sibling do these things? The Bible says yes, providing that they are true friends also. You see, sexual chemistry isn't strong enough of a foundation to get you through real adversity, nor are common hobbies. Nor is having fun together. It's not enough. The Bible says, and it's clear that there has to be more to it than that. And the Bible's answer again, friendship. You see, we're created for friendship. It's part of God's plan. You look at Adam in the Garden of Eden. He's in paradise. It's perfect. There's no sin. But even that wasn't good enough. It was not good for Adam to be alone. Even the Garden of Eden, paradise and perfection, was not enough without friendship. You see, we're all made in the image of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they're all loving, knowing, delighting in one another, in relationship for all eternity. And because Adam, you, and I are made in that image, we We desire relationship. Being in paradise isn't enough if we're lonely. Being in a great house isn't enough without friendship. A pink house in Will's case. (laughs) Being on a tropical holiday, it's not enough if we don't have friendships. See, what Jonathan shows us is covenantal friendship, and we'll come to that later. He is committed He is not a user like his father Saul. Proverbs 18 says this, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Friends stick. 
And it's interesting here, the comparison between quantities. You could have many companions and fall to ruin, but all it takes is one. So what are the ingredients of friendship? Within PBC, we have a lot of business women, a lot of business men. And so, so correct me if needs be, but businesses do a lot of cost-benefit analysis. Okay, all the time, and when they do this, they're predicting the potential profits and benefits that they will get out of an investment. What will the investment provide them? They get out their cost-benefit calculators. That one must also be wills. But the sad thing is, I, and I see this particularly in my generation, society often tells us to treat our friends in the same way. It's about take and little give. And if you are not getting, then get rid, press the old clear button. However, the Bible clearly tells us to live differently. We are to stick. We should allow room to consider investing in other people for their benefit. To allow room to invest in the other people that God has intentionally placed in our lives, as he did with Jonathan and David. So challenge yourself today. What are your opportunities to sacrifice for somebody else's gain? Did Jesus sacrifice himself on the cross for his own benefit? You see, if Jonathan did get out this cost-benefit calculator and purely served his father Saul, he would have become king. If he, if he purely served David, on the other hand, he too would have benefited in probably some kind of prime minister type role. But Jonathan was loyal to both. And that's important. He put God's will first. He served both, which eventually led to his death. There was no cost-benefit calculator in Jonathan's hands. Just sacrifice and commitment. Just friendship, right? Right? You might have noticed uh, the word covenants being quite significant in this passage. And I guess it could be compared to that as, of like the vows a couple make on their wedding day before God. It's the same concepts, but within the, the context of a friendship. So now we're going to play a little game of spot the difference. So eyes on the screen. So today in front of God, our family and our friends, it is without hesitation that I promise you this. I promise to respect you. I promise to support and encourage you at all times. I promise to pray with you and for you, just as you have always done for me. While I might have the strength to walk myself down the aisle, I could only make that long walk knowing that the man at the end of it was the man who chooses to make sure I never have to walk alone again. <laughs> when do I get my ring? There you go. When you're wedding planning, you watch a lot of rubbish like that. I'm sorry. <laughs> but can you see the difference? One is focusing solely on what they can give, submitting to God's authority, and then the other solely on what they can get. When can I get my ring, she said. And can you see that psychological shift that happens when we do submit to God's authority before ours? It's beautiful. It's fulfilling. It's love. It's eternal freedom, and it's joy. And, and we see that joy on, on Gregor's face when he's, when he's drumming, don't we? Drummers, if you know, you know he's beaming. And then when the song hits his core. <laughs> now, I've actually seen him in one instance play one-handed with his arm in the air. <laughs> but that's what joy does. It has an impact on us. That's what being in relationship with God does to, to us. Gregor, you have a gift. We all benefit from it. We'd all benefit from a camera and that drum beef as well. <laughs> but notice the depth of David and Jonathan's friendship. Verse 1, Jonathan became one spirit with David, and he loved him as himself. And this is kind of repeated later on throughout all the chapters as he renews his covenants with David. 
You know, how many times has a negative first impression that you've had of someone been flipped when you've invested in them and gotten to know their heart? This is how thousands of tourists see David. Does anybody know who this statue was made by? Gregor, first one, yeah, Michelangelo. So it's made of stone, you can only see the surface. surface. And this is how Saul saw David. But this is how Jonathan saw David. And it's the same way that God sees us, it's into our core. In all its strengths, all our weaknesses, And when you have a true friend like Jonathan and David did, transparency is beautiful. I read that 56% of Christians feel that their spiritual life is entirely private. And that just goes to show transparency is not easy. There's a lot of ugliness, a lot of brokenness for us to expose. But don't let pride get in the way as it did for King Saul. Band, if you would like to come up and get ready. Thank you. You see, Jonathan was loyal to David, despite all the ugliness, despite all the ugliness of what was going on. But David first through making... um, Sorry, he, he was loyal to David first through making a covenant, making that commitment... And also to his father by continuing to help him, eventually dying with him in battle. His loyalty and sacrificial friendship is ultimately what led to his death. Does this remind you of anyone dying for their friends? So, to quickly summarize what we've gone through so far, we've looked at the importance of friendship. It is essential. Singleness is okay. Invest in friends. That's the foundation. We've looked at how we're created for friendship. Made in God's image. The ingredients of friendship being commitment, sacrifice, and transparency. And I'm just going to finish with one one more thing. Jesus. He is our best friend. We look at John 15. Jesus says this to his disciples. I no longer call you servants. I call you friends. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You see, David was saved through Jonathan's sacrificial friendship. And we can only be saved through Jesus' sacrificial friendship. Jesus, friend of sinners, friends of you and I, king and friend. You see, Jonathan, he gives us a a good model of what friendship looks like, but Jesus betters it. His arms are wide open to let you in. Better than that, he, he left his heavenly home and they were nailed open on the cross. How much more sacrificial, committed, And personal, do you want your friend to be than this? Jesus, the greatest friend there is. Nothing you do, nothing you have done, no matter how bad, will ever separate you from this love. Or stop Jesus wanting to be your friend. And if you hadn't, and if you haven't already, the offer is there for you to have this friendship with Jesus today. So church, friends, let's step into friendship with Jesus and friendship with one another. What a friend we have in our King Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you love us so much that you sent your son to die on that cross. We thank you that 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 has eternal significance to us, that we can be in relationship with you for the rest of eternity. And we pray for your help, Father. Help us to be that better friend. Help us to commit 
to be sacrificial to the point that it hurts and to be transparent with those closest to us to let you in all the glory are yours now and forever Amen Shall we stand and we'll sing to that most faithful friend
One more time. What's a friend we have in Jesus? Oh, our sins and griefs to Heavenly Father, what an absolute privilege that we get to call you friend. Although you are mighty and powerful and strong and creator and potential in you to destroy and collapse, you are a God who's friend, who's chosen to call us friend. And so we choose right now to call you friend, good and faithful God. We worship you. Amen. Do grab yourself a, a seat as we come to, let's call this the main event, shall we? So uh, if you have never seen a baptism before, it might come across to you as a bit of a strange thing. Uh, a baptism obviously in involves water. Um, there's a, a big bath uh, across here. And in a few moments, Greg is going to go into the bath and be washed. Um, what's it all about? It's ordinary water. There's nothing special about it. It comes out of a tap. We pay a lot of money to Northwest Water to get that water. Um, but what it signifies is something very, very important. That water actually symbolizes a grave. What's happening today is that Gregory is going to come and step into a grave. In fact, he's going to step into his grave. He's going to step into the water, walk down into the water. It's like him dying to his old way of life, dying to a life where Gregor was king, dying to a life where Gregor was in charge of everything, dying to uh, sin and wrongdoing. And, and then we're going to um, take Gregor under the water. And it's uh, in the water, it's like Jesus is there washing away all of Gregor's wrongdoing, all of his sin, all of his past life. And then if he pays us a lot of money, we're going to bring him out of the water. <laughs> I say that because his dad's going to be involved in this. We're going to bring him out of the water. And it's like Gregor is stepping out of the grave into a new life. Dead is gone, alive is here. Stepping into eternal life. An opportunity now to live for God forever. Changed, transformed, serving Jesus, living for Jesus. No longer Gregor on the throne. Now all about Jesus. That's what we're going to do in just a few moments. Shall we listen to Gregor's story? Let's welcome him. Good morning, everyone. There's a lot of people here. <laughs> um, thank you so much for being here, specifically the first couple rows. A lot of people have traveled very far, um, Scotland, and there's obviously, as Ruben mentioned earlier, a lot of people watching online. Um, this will only take a few minutes. Um, but the first time I was in this building, I was two. So for as long as I can remember, Point and Baptist Church has been one of the most consistent parts of my life. Consistency is a very important thing to me. It's comforting, and regular change isn't something I deal too well with. So to everyone that has seen me grow up here, thank you so much for your fellowship and support. In the 18 years I've been here, both the building and the people inside have gone through a variety of seasons and lots of change. This church, as I've known it, uh, as I've known it, has always um, been blessed with great people dedicated to the youth. Jay Moore, who I don't think is here this morning, but Nate Evans, who is. Jay is here. Yay! Oh, amazing! Morning. Hi. <laughs> Jay and Nate. Um, the two youth leaders who served the church in my teenage years did an amazing job at nurturing my enthusiasm, answering difficult and often very uncomfortable questions as well. 
As well as these two lovely gents, I'd like to also mention Christine Pilkington, Will Dent, Amy Moore, formerly McCaig, Joel Whitewood, Erin Hutchinson, my mum, my dad, and my amazing sister Alice, who I can imagine all pray for me more than I realise. I've been so blessed with the effort that my mum and dad have put into raising me, keeping me around good people, and having some fantastic experiences together. All the people mentioned I credit to different parts of who I am today, physically and spiritually. Joel and Erin, you, uh, you may not know this, uh, but I do believe my regular attendance and appearance in the Sunday worship team is actually one of the reasons I am stood here today. Through a period where I felt most distant from God, the only time I let myself spend time with him was while I was playing in that drum cage. After a difficult lockdown, my experience with faith turned more sour. I had a lot of anger and confusion about who I thought God wanted me to be. Looking back, my understanding of God's character was weak, making assumptions instead of reading, getting upset about the world, why it had become such an anxious, inducing, and horrible place to be. Why? I'm sure Nate can confirm this. Uh, that was the word and simple question uh, that I asked most whenever we would uh, sometimes get together in the summer of 2020 and talk about the latest chapter of the Timothy Keller book that we were both reading together. I haven't, asked, uh, I haven't stopped asking why. I'm actually now lucky enough to get paid to ask the why. Whenever tackling with something in scripture or through a personal struggle of mine, I ask why in prayer and in peace, sometimes Google it, or actually ask two of my very wise uncles that are here today. Um, not, to, uh, not out of anger um, or stress, but curiosity and hope. That seems like a very big contrast, and I understand I've not really gone into too much detail about why and when I became a Christian, where, where I struggled, and how I came back to my faith stronger than ever. We'd be here all day if I went into detail on this, but actually, in its essence, that's it. When I was 12, I became a Christian. I struggled. I found God again. I struggled a lot more, and here we are. How did I do that? By trying to answer a question given to me by my sister Alice. Three years ago, she asked me, what do you think the character of God is? The easiest way to answer this question is to look at the accounts of Jesus' life. So this is what I did. From this frustration on the historical failures of the Western church, toxic messaging to minorities, and an overarching shame of who I wanted to be completely disappeared. The short list I just mentioned could go on for a very long time, but I can imagine everyone has their own very long list uh, as well. And this is what I came to realize. None of this had come from Jesus. I know I have a good understanding of God's character because Jesus is God, the Messiah, Elohim. I threw in a bit of Hebrew there for you, Reuben. How I know this? I could talk for a very long time. However, I would massively recommend a few of Lee Strobel's books. A man completely dedicated and fascinated to the resurrection uh, of Jesus Christ and uh, an obsession with history, biology, and the first century. God has written his name into all of my plans over the last few years. He has brought me some incredible people. Uh, he has brought some incredible people into my life, which I am extremely lucky. Um, he also helped me sustain friendships that I know will now last a lifetime. So Millie and Oscar, thank you so much for being here this morning. I love you both very much. Finally, I'm getting baptized today because I'm confident in three things. I'm confident in who God truly is, not what people want him to be. I'm confident in who God says I am, and I'm confident uh, of who I want to be for him and with him. There you go. Okay, so let's get yourselves into a good position to see. Uh, if there are children here, do you want to come and uh, gather around the stage, but not in the pool? Gregor. Oh, Dave Diable, I love you. This is so warm. <laughs> okay, can everyone sort of... Millie makes it, you can see, you can see Oscar. Awesome. So Gregor, I have a verse 
which I think is for you. It's from the Gospel of John, chapter 15. It's well known, where Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, says these words, I am the vine. Gregor, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Shall we pray together? Father God, thank you so much for Gregor. Thank you for what he means to so many people. Thank you from the time that he was conceived until now, your hand has been on his life. Thank you for his love for others, for the world, for music, for his friendship and companionship. God, I just really pray for an outpouring of your Holy Spirit in new and surprising ways for Gregor from now and for the remainder of his life. I really pray that all aspects of his life, his work, his home life, his relationships, his friendships, that he will really know that your spirit is there. Your spirit is the one that is making, he's aware of you being the way maker. Your spirit is the one that he knows you are the peacemaker, the promise keeper, and the miracle worker. And may that become and continue to be a real reality in his life. Thank you, Lord, so much for this day. Thank you for your faithfulness. And thank you for honoring it. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tim. Gregor, I've got three questions for you. Gregor Watson, do you believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and your Savior? I do. Gregor, in this year baptism, do you repent of your sins? I do. And now, Gregor, will you promise to love God and follow him and worship him and seek him for the rest of your days? then because you've asked to be baptized, then because you love Jesus, we gladly baptize you into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Guys, the, uh, the baptistry is so warm today. Um, there are a number of people in this church I know who, who haven't yet been baptized and who know Jesus and love Jesus and want to follow Jesus and want to serve Jesus. Um, but you've never taken that step of obedience to follow Jesus. Jesus says, repent, say sorry to God, and be baptized, every single one of you. And two things will happen. The first thing is this. Um, you will be forgiven for all your sins, all your wrongdoing, all your stuff, you will be forgiven for. Jesus will just wipe it away. The Bible says that he will put your sins behind his back so he can no longer see them again. Or he will throw your sins into the deepest part of the deepest sea. They will disappear. And the second thing is that the Holy Spirit will come. The Holy Spirit will come and fill you. All, all, all before you say yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit's dancing around your life. But when you say yes to Jesus, you give him an invitation to step into your life. Give you, give, give, gives him an invitation to step in and take control, to be your guide, to be your friend, to be your advocate. Sometimes to tell you off, but always to direct you towards Jesus. The baptistry is really warm. We're, we're, we're going to sing that song again. Um, Tim and I are going to stay in the water. There's no obligation, but if you would like to be baptized, we'll find out clothes. We'll work that out. Um, but if you know that the Spirit of the living God is, is prompting you to this next step, you don't have to wait till we next baptize people. You can do that today. I know it's awkward, I know it's weird, and there really is no pressure. But Holy Spirit, if there are people here in this room right now who know they need to take this next step and do what Gregor has done and publicly give their life to Jesus, then we're going to ask you to prompt them right now in Jesus' name and just come forward and be baptized. Should we stand? And if you want to come and get baptized, just come and chat with me down the front and we can make that happen. i 
Trust in the one who created the stars and the sun. You are eternally kind, always faithful and endlessly wise. Oh Lord, you are the shepherd of my soul. down my plans, I give up my rights, and let you take control of this surrendered life. Oh Lord, you are the shepherd of my soul, and I lay down my plans, I give up my rights, and let you take control of this surrendered life. One last call. Tim's starting to get cold in the water. So one last call to lay down your life, give up your rights, your plans, and let God take control of your surrendered life. This surrendered Okay, we're going to finish with the song that we started with, that song of thanksgiving. So let's sing this together. Yeah. 
sanctifies His holy name. His holy name. For He is greatly. For He is greatly. To be praised. Oh, to be praised. Oh, magnify. Oh, magnify. His holy name. His holy name. For He is greatly. For He is greatly. drown them out with a louder shout of praise even when the battles roar we're gonna praise you lord because you are always worthy even if the rocks cry out we're gonna drown them out with a louder shout of praise even when the battles roar we're gonna praise you lord because you are Amen, amen, amen. Do just grab a seat for a second because, of course, we've got to finish with some notices. Um, tonight at 6.30, we're continuing on with our imitate course, trying to imitate Jesus. Um, so if you'd like to come to that, that's 6.30 here in our clay space. Tomorrow morning at 7 o'clock, we are back online for our early morning prayer. Zoom at 7 o'clock. That's 7 o'clock, Joel. It's my day off. Yeah. <laughs> but not from prayer. <laughs> awesome. Um, uh, if you remember last week, we're trying to um, read our way through the whole Gospels. You know you've got all these amazing Bible apps on your phones, your, your, your 365, Lectio 365, and your Bible in one year. Well, we've got paper. <laughs> Come on. Um, we're trying to read through the Gospels in one year, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Um, they will be on the welcome desk. Has anyone been doing it this week? You succeed on seven days on the chart. Awesome. Okay. They're on our welcome desk at the end. Please do come and grab one of those. And finally, two things. Next Sunday, if you've started coming to this church, if you come to the church for the first time in 2023, in the last 12 months, we have a newcomer's lunch for you, straight after our second service. So next week, two services again, 9.30 and 11.30, straight after the 11.30, beginning at about half past one, a newcomer's lunch, free of charge. We'd love to tell you a little bit about the church, about how you can be involved in the church, uh, and also... Uh, to answer any questions that you have about our church. So if you've been coming to the church for the past 12 months or so uh, and would like to know more, that is for you next Sunday at about half past one. Finally, if you want to know more about Jesus, and quite honestly, Jesus has transformed my life and the life of everyone in this room. If you want to find out more about Jesus, we're going to be running a new Alpha course. Uh, we 
It's a course where you get the chance to meet with Jesus. Ask any questions you like about Christianity. Who is God? Who is Jesus? Why did Jesus die? What is this church thing? Who, what's the Bible all about? That kind of thing. Um, if you are interested, um, just scan this code right now or find out more information on our welcome desk at the back. It starts on the 25th of January, 7.30 to 9.30. It's free of charge. Uh, bring your friends with you. Come yourself. You are massively, massively welcome. Why not in 2024 give three months to find out if this Jesus person really rocks, if this Jesus person really is who he claims to be? Thank you so much. We thank you so much, especially those who have come for Gregor's baptism. We thank you those who are watching online. The Lord bless you in 2024. The Lord keep you in 2024. The Lord make his face shine upon you in 2024. The Lord be gracious to you in 2024. The Lord give you his shalom, which is a word that means wholeness and completeness, harmony with God, and peace with God for eternity. Amen. Coffees and tea at the back. Thank you so much for coming along.